welcome to Hack Circus. This is the second part of the interview with comedian, writer, actor and broadcaster Steve Punt. If you missed part one, don't worry, you can listen to this one first and then go back and listen to the other one. But I do recommend listening to both to get the full picture. In this episode, Steve talks about topical comedy, storytelling, his ideas about drama and soap opera and narrative and documentaries too. We talk about his Radio 4 series, Punt P.I., of which I think all the episodes, or at least most of them, are on BBC iPlayer. I highly recommend Punt P.I. It's a a superb documentary series, really quite light-hearted but very cleverly put together. Hack Circus is also a magazine and an event series, so if you go to hackcircus.com, you'll find out more about the project in general. If you are enjoying the episodes... Please like and subscribe on iTunes. It really makes a difference and it only takes a second to hit the stars. Uh, We're also on Facebook. It's facebook.com stroke Hack Circus podcast. We've got our own podcast page now and Twitter at Hack Circus. So follow us there. An interesting thing, really, about comedy is is that there's none of that old school stagecraft. Yes, people have stagecraft, as, as we were talking about. They have a persona and they have, but they don't have stagecraft in the sense that they don't, or well, some do. But but you don't have to wear a suit. You don't have to close with a song. You don't have to uh, even brush your hair if you don't want to. You know, and I think I think that changed in the 80s. That changed while I was at university as a result of alternative comedy. And we did, Hugh and I did in our early days, we did a couple of things with comedians of that older generation. Uh, so we once, for example, did a little tiny guest stop spot when we were really just starting out on a show with Ronnie Corbett. And... It was slightly weird because he was a bit upset we weren't wearing ties. And so he wanted some sort of young alternative comics on it, but on the other hand, he wanted them to wear proper suits. The big tour we did after the Mary Whitehouse experience, that was the first time we'd both worn suits. In fact, you didn't wear a suit. No, I wore a suit in that tour. I thought, it's time for a suit. Hugh did not switch to a suit, I think probably until the tour you saw I, th- I reckon yeah. I reckon on the Manchester title tour he wore a suit but I think on the Milky Milky tour he was still wearing a polo shirt and, and um, no jacket that all changed in the 80s because uh, before that I think comedians pretty much did all that stuff that we now think of as a joke you know that they really wore bow ties and they really wore proper jackets, and they and they cl- would close with a song because you had to have a bit of stagecraft. Yes. You had to give people a show. It's the st- kind of lovely. Like, well, like the strange, so what's what I was going to say. The strange thing is, is as I've got older, I've started to think. Yeah, there was you know there was something in that because the the the, the comedy circuit when Hugh and I started was sometimes referred to as the alternative cabaret circuit rather than the alternative right. comedy circuit yeah. and even though th- there was it was mostly stand up uh, there were lots of what you'd call ver- more sort of what you call variety there was a double act who used to do jonglers a lot who were th- like fire jugglers mm. you know who would close the first half who would throw flaming torches at each other and there were there was a couple of really great magicians um, and I sort of really like all that I always like people who have an actual skill you know because there's always there's a there's a, like a little part of me that feels slightly fraudulent that but it's slightly because you because you know how to write comedy, like you, you know, you know how to make things funny. So you, you have the same skill as the other comedians in yeah, a way. It so it's like, yeah. If it was all jugglers and one comedian, they'd all be like, yeah, you no, know, but it just, it just always yeah. feels like it's just a succession of people come on. Uh, and in those days, it would have been far more almost all men as well. There were there were a few female stand-ups, but nowhere near as many as now. Um, which is something that's 
massively improved, I think, on the comedy circuit. And it was already very solo stand-up dominated, to the extent that one of the things that really worked for Hugh and I was that the compare would, you know, after you'd had three stand-ups, the compare would bring on another microphone. So there'd be two microphones, and the audience would go, Heart of Visual Feast! <laughs> it's going to be two blokes in shirts. Uh, and we used props, and we used to, you know... Hugh had a bag of props, including an inflatable seagull and various silly hats. And so you said just, you said Hugh did rather than you. So is it still a kind? Was it even then a sort uh, of thing where was, he would do characters? It was or much this? more that then. Right. It was really uh, me narrating. Right. And yeah. Hugh. Was that why you, how did that happen? That, that that was how the chemistry worked. Was it because you you naturally fell into those roles, or um, did you sort of do? Did you ever decide? I don't it happened do that. really because Hugh was very good at voices right. and accents, yeah, okay. and uh, so the the act naturally uh, sort of tried to work to our strengths. Yeah. And I thought my my strength was accurate delivery of words, yeah. often t- quite f- fast, um, and uh, and sort of narrating. Um, so we'd, we'd, all our early acts were, were in the form of a sort of spoof story, narrative, where I would narrate and he would do all the voices within the story. So one of them was based around a bank robbery, for example. Of a, so, the, so he was this, this character, the professor, who was putting together his sort of heist team, which were all different voices. There was a Scottish getaway driver and there was a... I can't remember what the other characters were. And then... Um, and then a couple of comedy policemen trying to catch them, and then, and it went in and out of sketches, and and there was a there was a, a sort of chase sketch, there was, um, and then we got rid of that, and that turned the second one we did was like a murder sort of spoof Agatha Christie esque murder mystery, where I was a detective and Hugh was all the suspects, and I would be interviewing him, and it all took place. It was called Murder at Strangemore Manor. And uh, and we were still doing that actually. On um, if 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 you were to put yourself through the um, DVD of the uh, Milky Milky tour, you will find there's a huge chunk of the second half missing. It's, the, the first half's there in its entirety, and then the beginning and the end of the second half. But we deliberately left Murder at Strangeable Manor off in order that we could carry on using it because we thought well. The audience won't have seen our club act, so mm. we'll do all the Merry Wants Experience stuff in the first half, and then they won't realise the second half is basically our old act. <laughs> um, and But what was good about it was that it was in a very different style to the White House stuff, and it had lots of um, bits that we really knew how to do because we'd done them literally hundreds of times uh, at the comedy store and places. Uh, and there was there was a routine at the end. I can't even remember how we got to this, but there was a routine. There was a routine called Ghosts, which was me talking about some famous um, uh, some famous ghost sightings from around the country. Uh, Particularly, you know, you get those crappy little pamphlets. Mm. Uh, whenever you go anywhere, there's always little local history oh, yes. books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like it was the tourist information. hauntings. Yeah, yeah. It was a sort of spoof of that kind of thing. <laughs> so it was, it was just like a selection of, of, of weird apparitions that had appeared around the country. And because Hugh had discovered that he had this big overcoat, raincoat that he put on, that if you put two cushions in this <laughs> coat to build his shoulders up, yeah. he could then fasten it over the top of his head <laughs> and look as if he had no head. And I thought this was incredibly funny. So we developed this thing, which is pure visual bit, where I was talking about this, the, the most feared ghost in the country is the, the rude ghost of Guildford. And this was basically just Hugh making r- rude gestures <laughs> as this headless ghost. Yeah. And, and yeah. so, sort of abusing the audience. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but because he transformed himself just while the audience were watching... And it, it, just, just with these cushions and this coat, and he would turn around and do it, and then turn around like that, and 
it was just great. I used to love it because I knew where all the laughs were going to be. So I thought, this is great because the audience will be expecting stand up, and actually, we've got some visual stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't think they kind of expected it, and it was great fun to do. Neil Malarkey saw us once at the Comedy Store, and afterwards he said, oh, I get it now. He said, It's Steve Punz and his naughty friend. <laughs> he would often be physically slightly behind me. So, from the audience's point of view, it looked like he doesn't know what I'm doing. Yeah. And we played a lot with that, of, uh, of him hearing me say something and spot an opportunity to put on a hat. Because what you find, the joy, the joy of touring, and this is the opposite of, of how you can only do things once, is that stuff develops that isn't there originally. Mm. So, we've had a couple of instances. There was one on the last tour where we found that it was funnier to mess something up than actually get it right so we had a very wordy bit which I do sort of like and we, we have one of those real sort of fast talky wordy bits that's very impressive if you get it right and one night I completely messed it up and it was, there was a huge laugh because we were looking at each other and it, yes. you, you do they all love that. it when it goes wrong yeah they love it when <laughs> it goes wrong so then the trick is to, to make sure it goes wrong every night <laughs> but make it look like it's spontaneous and again it comes down to uh, you're acting that yeah, but the skills. trick of it is that it mustn't look like you're acting it because one of, one of the things I've never quite understood about the sheer volume of stand-up is that stand-up comedy is very limited for television really you know, the, the, you, what, what television craves is is people who can make stuff for television. Stand-up comedy in its purest form, i.e. a head behind a microphone, is not really great telly. And um, it's interesting how some of the most highly regarded stand-ups do very little television. Because, weirdly, Eddie Izzard, for example, has never done a TV series. And he's one of the most famous people you could think of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. He's never done. He's never done a TV series. D- Dylan Moran has never done a stand-up series. He's obviously done sitcom and acting, but he's never done a series, stand-up series. But you don't really get stand-up comedy on no. TV except as one-off specials. And people weave it into their panel show stuff, and then it's, it's always a little bit jarring. That's a bit real, like, oh, you're doing that's that. That's a real bugbear. That's a real bugbear. <laughs> That's one of the really one of the things I'm I'm most proud of with the Now Show is that we we sort of provide a platform for stand-ups who are willing to give it a go of writing something that's genuinely topical. Because what happens with stand-ups is that you slowly put together your precious 20, 25 minutes that you can turn up to any club in the country and do. But and if you're told well you can't do that because this is a topical show you've got to, we would like you to write something about this uh, in news story some of them are just don't really want to do that and others of them go oh okay I'll have a go and, it, and if it works which it will because the audience will be on your side then it, it gives you tremendous confidence because you suddenly realise there's so much more comedy in you than you thought yeah yeah and the, the difficulty, I think, particularly when people start, is that they think that they've got they think they've got a little finite amount of jokes in their head, and once they've mined them all out, they're going to be gone. Yeah, because maybe because that first twenty minutes is so painful, you're yeah, just yeah, like that must be all there so is. So long to yeah. get that right. Yeah. But actually, what happens is it's a kind of fission process. Do you find it helps um, the the sort of routine that you have, or when now shows on that you're doing, and um, well, all the panel shows and things that you do as well, where you have to write regularly every week? Is there something that's like is like a workout? It's like you get better at it if you do it regularly, or um, you? I suppose the more ideas you throw out, the more chance you have of something being good, or is it um, just you get better at writing jokes? I suppose. Yes, I think. I, I think it's a mixture of the fact that you, you're working regularly, but al- but also it's that you're told what to write. I think that one of the problems with... I, personally, I've always found that the biggest nightmare for a writer is to be told you can write whatever you want. 
it's the equivalent of when the improv people go give us a film style yeah, yeah, give us yeah. a title you've got to have something yeah. for your brain to feed off and so the great thing with topical comedy is that you 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 the subject matter is never a problem you know you're never sitting there thinking what we're going to write about mm-hmm. what you write about is literally in front of you This episode is sponsored by the School of Machines, Making and Make-Believe, an experimental school where you can learn emerging technologies and make art in short, beginner-friendly and intensive one-month programmes at the intersection of art, technology, design and human connection. Check out their upcoming four-week programme, Influencing Disruption, in Barcelona this October, where you'll learn to code for the web while exploring it as a medium for activism, social change and political commentary, while having loads of fun with like-minded people. Find out more at schoolofma.org. That's schoolofma.org. And I can vouch for these guys because I worked at the School of Machines Making and Make Believe last summer, and it was brilliant. Okay, back to the show. It's, it's very easy, I think, to get too wound up about what something is about rather than about the thing itself. I always think this is a real problem with sitcom. You know, the first question with sitcom is, always, well, what's it about? And the, the, the fact is, it doesn't matter. It really genuinely doesn't matter what sitcom is about. It's purely about the way the characters relate to each other. And actually, the, the situation they're in if you're reliant on that for jokes then it's not a very good sitcom what's what's a good sitcom in your eyes like an example of one that you think is really really works well the sitcom I've most enjoyed watching over is probably Frasier because again it it demands quite a lot of its audience Mm. what I like about it is that it it never talks down it assumes that the audience can go with it Mm. and it isn't afraid (laughs) <laughs> to this is this is what Hugh and I refer to this as the Frampton Comes Alive problem. Um, you won't know Frampton Comes Alive; it's before your time. But it was a terrible album from the time when we were at school, and it was one of those albums that, uh, if you'd seen Frampton Comes Alive in someone's album collection, you would have gone, "Oh no!" Um, and uh, we wrote a bit once for a show we did with Nick Hancock where uh, this was uh, around the same time as White House actually sort of early 90s and there was a line in the show that where as a shorthand for saying that this character was a bit naff someone said uh, I spotted Frampton Comes Alive in his record collection right? right and the script editor who was much older than us said oh, I'm not sure the audience will understand that I'm not sure that's well known enough uh, couldn't we change it to Saturday Night Fever? And we had a really long discussion about this <laughs> because we, our view was that the people who the people who got Friends of Comes Alive would really get it and they would love it. The people who didn't would realise what it was just through context, and they would kind of go, "I don't get that, but I know what that must mean." If we made it Saturday Night Fever everybody would get it but it wouldn't be funny because it wasn't right it wasn't right in various different ways and it just didn't have that kind of it was precisely the fact it was slightly niche either you'd have to slightly dig that out of your memory if you were old enough um, that that it worked and this this thing of of do you go with the mainstream everyone will get it version or do you go with the niche some people won't get it but it's right it's an argument that comes up again and again and again and you often notice I think in really good stuff you know if if you look at The Office or you look at Partridge and stuff like that you'll notice that they invariably go with the the niche thing some of the some of the bands and some of the tracks that Alan Partridge refers to are very niche they're not big hits that everyone remembers I only quote that because because we have 
we, we have numerous times, I mean, it's years ago now, but we still tend to say, oh, no, this is the Frampton Comes Alive discussion. <laughs> right. Because this, yeah. this comes up again and again and again. And there's, what reminded me of it was that there's a particular moment on Frasier where the, the, uh, the plot was that the father, fed up with these two feet sons, wanted to take them ice fishing in Alaska to do a manly thing together. The, the, the mother is dead, right? And uh, um, so the, the plot was that these two guys who are both uh, opera-loving, um, wine-quaffing, you know, they're not ice-fishing types. That's kind of the joke. But their father is. So they agree to go ice-fishing with their dad. And... Uh, Niles, who is the the even more sort of uh, young fogey of the two, disappears for a few moments, a few scenes. He's not there and you don't know why. Little do we know that he's been shopping to prepare for his ice fishing trip. And then what happens is the father and Fraser are talking. There's a knock on the door and the door is opened and Niles is standing there in this ridiculous sou'wester and boots and full ice fishing outfit which if you know the character is because it, it's a, and a fishing rod and uh, just looking completely over the top ice fishing outfit and the audience laugh because he looks so f- funny and the laugh dies down and Niles then says call me Ishmael now I maintain that this is not a niche show in America. This is a this is a network, yeah. massive network comedy show. I very much doubt whether the average American viewer knows any more than the average British viewer that that is the opening line of Moby Dick. I don't think that that many people know that. I did English at university, so I happen to... Oh, I see. But what impressed me was that even though they must have known that a very large contingent of the audience wouldn't actually quite get that reference that's what Niall said Uh, the reason why he said it is because that is what that character would say it is absolutely perfectly in character for Niles who, who is a terribly pretentious young man that is exactly what he would say. So they obviously had the Frampton Comes Alive discussion. <laughs> and they obviously said, right, even though we're on network TV, we're going to say the thing that's right for the character. And the audience are going to laugh anyway because they're going to know that the integrity of the line is right. The reason that works is because the audience can smell the integrity of the writing. They haven't gone, let's dumb it down, let's think of something else that all the audience will get because that would not be what Niles Crane would say. I, I, in a way, I think this, uh, this argument it happens a lot more than it used to because one of the really difficult things, I think, for comedians now is that the, the common shared references are so difficult to find because the media is so disparate. Mm. What's really changed, and this has changed, I think, since the Now Show started, in the time the show's been on air, what's really changed is that even the most popular TV shows in the country, there are even really popular things or things that get massive media coverage, very few people actually know. Game of Thrones, things like Mad Men, even more so. Huge media awareness, but you can't do Mad Men joke because hardly anyone's watched it. So those kind of universal references that comedians used to be able to rely on going, you know, you know this, you know this. Um, It's also why they often tend to hark back to things that have been around for ages now. Somebody, one of the producers at the BBC, said, "Why, why are there so many Star Wars jokes? You know, to we go, well because it's one of the very few things that you just know everyone has seen. Yeah. Live shows are obviously different because your, your audience is self-selecting. The rise of, sort of science-based comedy in the last few years, which is great, is, uh, I think, partly down to 
um, the, the fact that people f feel less need to try it now and find things that will appeal to everybody. There has been a move more recently towards much more information heavy comedy because I think um, th th there's always two there's two elements to any because you can't laugh at something until you understand it. So clearly what you're doing with jokes is two things. You're, you're giving the audience information and, and then you're making jokes about the information you've given them. And if you restrict yourself to the information you're, you're confident that the entire audience will already know, you're clearly hugely restricted in, in what you can talk about. If you're constantly thinking, well, maybe people won't know about that. Yeah. If you decide, OK, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell them stuff and then make jokes about it, you can tell them literally anything you want. The trick is to get an audience interested. So as if an audience is interested, they will understand anything. You just think, OK, people are going to have to... I'm going to have to tell people this, but that's fine. Yeah, yeah, and, and almost, in a way, better because you know that no other comic is doing that. Like, there's nobody you're competing with that's also doing something about Latin, probably. It's, you know, yeah, exactly. it's something yeah, that's yeah. like... Yeah, I mean, you're, you're the you're only just, one. You're just you, otherwise, it's all jokes about splitting up with your girlfriend. And, yeah, yeah. And then, and, you know, there, there was certain... Um, Oh, when we went to Montreal, somebody who'd been there before said, when you watch the American stand-ups, what you'll find is they're really good, but they all follow exactly the same set. Right. <laughs> and he said, watch out, they'll come on. They'll come on, they'll, they'll say how much they love Montreal, and then they'll talk about the flight here and the airline food. <laughs> and I thought they were joking, but I went to this place, Club Soda, and we sat, Hugh and I sat and watched three American stand-ups in a row, they were all really good. They all had really nice suits on. And they did all come on. They all started off, hey, Montreal, great city. I love this city. And, they, and the flight here, whoa. Yeah. And then they did 10 minutes about the airline and the airline food. And I remember a stand-up comedian saying to me, um, oh, comedians are always on trains. That's why so much stand-up material is about trains, because you're always touring or you're always going somewhere. Yeah, you're always yeah, in your car or you're yeah. always on a train. So, yeah. hey, I was on a train the other day, like, and I didn't even notice that. And then after I was told that, I kept seeing it in everybody's set. You start noticing yeah, yeah, yeah. these things. Well, it, it, goes, like, it also goes in... Um, it also goes in, in phases of life, you know, you can see it in stand there's a point when stamps are in their 30s, they do stuff about becoming parents or, mm. you know, yeah, or being yeah. kept awake all night to, and, and they get older and it's, it's about, you know, doll being a parent. Yeah. Um, it's about your mortality. As and you yeah, <laughs> yeah, and obviously when they're younger, it's all about sort of renting flats and splitting up the gun dividing up your CDs well not anymore but yes, yeah, yeah. that used to be a, a real staple yeah, yeah. and uh, there were various ones that you could kind of tick off mm. I thought uh, are we, are we going to get to the are we going to get to the uh, smoking dope late at night and going to the all night garage <laughs> we're going to be able to we're going to be able to tick that one off yep there we go <laughs> Um, yeah, the, uh, yeah, yeah right. as you say, trains. On the subject of trains, I I saw a brilliant talk once um, where the guy, as part of the talk, it wasn't about this, but as part of it, he said something like, um, "I think the reason people like Jason Bourne is because all he does is commutes, so we can relate to him." And they just showed all these slides of Jason Bourne on a train, on a plane, waiting in an airport. Like it just looks like he's commuting all the time. And I thought that's what I like about Pump P.I. and <laughs> your radio show is that there's so much just travelling and you I yes. wanted to talk to you about your sense of direction because you <laughs> I love that you're always getting on the wrong train and stuff because I do that all the time as well yeah, yeah, yeah. the wrong bus the wrong well um, I've I was very lucky there really because I was put with a really good producer and it, it I've learnt a great deal from from doing those shows um because what the, what the documentary department's producers are brilliant at is, is they understand the way they think of a documentary is entirely in terms of storytelling. Mm. It's all about storytelling. And it kind of chimed with me because I'm very interested in the relationship between jokes and stories and how they're both... Um, they're both about how you control the release of information. Mm. They're both about what the audience know when, um, what you hold back, what you do get, you know. I've, I've, I've long had this, long noticed that when comedy writers change genre, it's almost always to thrillers or detective stories. 
because the two things are very closely related. Wow. They're both they're they're both about, as I say, structuring a narrative where the end's got to take you by surprise, mm-hmm. and you have to give all the clues along the way. You can't cheat because then the joke doesn't work and the detective, you know. Um, but equally, you can't you can't give away the punchline stroke murderer too early they're, they're really very similar in structure um, and so I I was really impressed in the way that putting those together the producers are very rigorous about how we tell the story we don't want to tell them that yet you know you save that moment for like halfway through or you know when you see a really well constructed documentary um, there used to be a series on Channel 4 called Rough Justice, which was just great, because every week they would, they would tell you about someone who was in prison and they'd, they'd tell you about the case. And by halfway through, you're thinking, this person is clearly guilty. Yeah. They're, they're, they should have banged them up. They're yeah. quite right. And then the second half, they would dismantle it so that by the end you were going, they must be released now. <laughs> and, you know, a skillful narrative fiction or non-fiction just takes you on a journey hugely overused word journey mm-hmm. uh, at the moment but um, but it's it's so much of it is about storytelling it's what human beings are naturally do mm-hmm. and I had a very long I had a very interesting conversation with, with the producer of Pump PI once about this because we were both interested in it and he was giving a talk to other radio producers about it and we had this long conversation in which uh, I was just top of my head stuff. But we kind of realised as a result of this that um, I have a friend who used to work at the Tate Gallery and always used to tell me that the most popular posters, the pictures of Tate Britain that people like most, are those Victorian um, pictures where you are trying to work out what's happened. Do you know what I mean? Those kind of paintings where there's one called A Hopeless Dawn, for example. The picture itself is just two women in a cottage with their heads on the table. But you immediately work out the husbands have died. And you, you work out that the, the fishing fleet haven't come back. But none of that's in the painting. It's, it's just the people and the inside of the cottage. And... Well, it's that thing you're saying you, again, of like that you have to work it out. Yeah, yeah. it's like, yeah. It's, it's like a... A little scene from a drama, but it's a single image. It's like a great photograph, you know. You look at the photograph and you want to know what were the circumstances that led up to that and what was the result. We naturally follow stories with incredible efficiency, you know. It's, it's often occurred to me, it's often that our, our capacity for following narrative is actually amazing. You know, you quite often talk to people who are following three or four TV series at once. Or they'll be going, oh, I watch EastEnders and Neighbours, and I'm following this, and I'm following it. And they'll have five worlds, narratives, in their head at once that they can just dip in and out of and follow. And they're reading a book. You know, it's addictive, isn't it? It's you want like, as many Your brain as you need desperately them. wants mm. all the time to, to put things into a story. And jokes really are, very often they're tapping into that. They're taking you on a little journey and then they're, your mind naturally runs ahead, yeah. tries to work out what's coming. Yeah. And then... This and, is, and is delighted when it doesn't. It's the same with magic. I was talking to a magician about this, how the rhythm of magic is very similar to the rhythm of comedy and then you get to the end and you're kind of thwarted and it's like a delightful... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Magic. Well, it's, it, again, the old script writing cliche is... is uh, that you should give the audience what they want, but not in the way that they expect. Ah, yeah. And uh, that's often it. So again, with a with any kind of detective story or thriller or any kind of plot like that, the, the, the audience know the ending they want, and they're disappointed if they don't get that ending, but they don't want that ending to be... They, they want it to be that ending, but not in the obvious way what they want those kind of how they're going to get out of this moment it's 
it would be lovely if every week there was a beautiful twist. At but the I mean, end. even even if it's quite obvious that it's a there's a banal explanation, you'll kind of go, or is it? So you know, there's like a little kind of sense that maybe they're maybe <laughs> we've, keeping that mystery alive. The ones I most like are the ones where we genuinely find something mm. new. Mm. because then there's a really legitimate... What we don't want it to be, really, is just relating a case. It, it, it's really nice to have some... Even, even if it's very small, but some yeah, little the, the, element. The um, Bristol Hum one, there was a, like a, a phone recording from the guy at the end in Leeds who sent you a clip. That's why and, when yeah. the producer said, oh, Michael's just got in touch with us, well, that's great, because that, yeah, we'll that. that gives us our little mm. twist ending. Um because it's it's actually it's it, it's slightly tricky one that because it is people are very unwilling to accept that it is internal right. and uh, because actually the the most the most logical explanation is that it is some kind of of tinnitus yeah this this thing for for listeners there's an episode in this series of amazing investigations into different sort of local mysteries I suppose or unsolved mysteries there's an investigation into the thing called the Bristol Hum which is a sound which in lots of towns and cities and parts of the world actually different parts of the world people claim to have heard this inexplicable humming noise and and as your show went on it became more and more clear that it was it seemed to me it was something that was in people's heads because it was like it's in your house and then it's in your car with you and then yeah. it follows you to another house hmm that's one thing in common with all these places and it's it's you yeah yeah <laughs> but, um, it's, it was incredibly uh, that was an interesting one because it's slightly out of genre we don't normally do mm. phenomena we normally do yeah. specific yeah. stories yeah. and the other one that you mentioned uh, that you'd been listening to the Bella in the Witch Elm oh yeah that yeah. was a particularly I really like that one mm. because it's such a extraordinary story. Yeah, That's I feel like there are loads of them and they're all online. I've listened to about literally. I've listened to about twelve in the last couple of days, just like back to yeah, back. Yeah, they're yeah. so addictive. They're such great. But what was great about Bella and the Witch Elm? That was well. What was great was again that we went through the police file and we did find this little tucked away note. Um, from several years later that someone someone called Bella had disappeared from this area of who was a um, prostitute I think and that that was the obvious because uh, you know as, as you know from watching uh, dozens of of, uh, <coughs> of detective based dramas the the um, Usually, the the obvious explanation is often right, mm. you know. So, so, so they, they they will know that it'll really kind of stranger murders, and they're very rare. Mm. Usually, it's someone the person knows. Usually, it's someone local. Yeah. Um, and uh, they did so in amongst all these sort of weird theories about how it might have been a German spy or. It might have been some mysterious Dutch woman who may or may not have been passing on information about armaments factories. Um, it's horribly more likely that it was just some some poor woman from Birmingham, and they and they did find a a, a note, a police note, which obviously hadn't been followed up. It's an amazing case. It's, it's genuinely a case of of truth being stranger than fiction, which is a, le- a lesson you learn quite a lot actually when you deal with uh, when you're dealing with the news or trying to find stuff that's that's started in real life it's sometimes i know people often say as a joke oh you know it's beyond satire or you know you you can't satirize this um but sometimes you do feel like it's really difficult to write something that that is uh beyond what what's real yeah i mean they're all true true investigations and you actually do the investigating like you hear the, the show is I just find it so brilliant I think it's a perfect documentary and you, you hear you you know Steve's voice phoning up all these people saying Can, you're trying to track down aeroplanes and phoning around hundreds of people well, what was quite <laughs> interesting actually was that the, the, all those kind of documentaries are much more authentic now than they would have been pre-2009 because you used to be able to 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 a certain extent to slightly fake things like that right. in the sense that you 
could phone someone up and and obviously you would have phoned them up but you wouldn't necessarily have to record it and then you could just record yourself talking to, to nobody but after the the Jonathan Ross Russell Brand affair a lot of very strict rules <laughs> came oh, in wow, right. which applied across the board that you're not allowed to fake anything so um, you can't pretend to phone people up if you didn't you can't you can't also edit things to you know very occasionally there'll be an interview that I'm not available for or just on the phone or something where the producer will do the interview and I can't drop questions in afterwards or pretend that I did that interview you're not allowed to fake anything anymore 